I'm worried this might be a bit too aesthetic, but well, not aesthetic, but you know what I mean, uh, abstract at points. But why uh, I'm talking about Adrian is because I work with a lot of startups. We try general startup stuff. Um, so there's the engine shed in Bristol, so we came down here and we did a similar thing in Oxford. Um, and recently we've been focusing more on AI based startups for a couple of reasons, but I'll, I don't know if I'll come into it, but one of them is that I've been doing AI stuff for some time although not in a um, particularly good way. Uh, so, uh, an enthusiastic amateur. Um, yeah, so, uh, I call it New Opium because um, we're interested in, what, in the work we do is how we get people hooked on our products. So, uh, we do work for things like Formula One, how we get people hooked on the digital products of Formula One. Uh, we do uh, work in a B2B context, how do we get people like uh, creative copywriters or lawyers um, to, point here, how do we get people hooked on the technology that we're building? Um, and um, the opium or wars uh, and, the, and, and that sort of type of history is an example of how it all fits together and how the economics uh, uh, intersect with addiction. So um, this is a Nia Hayal, he's a guy who wrote the book Hooked, has anybody read the book Hooked? One Nia Hayal, no? I recommend it, it's a good one, it's about how you can make addictive products. Uh, but he tries to put position it as addictive products for good, and we'll come on to that some, on good part, which is um, important. Uh, so this is where I grew up, in Papua New Guinea. Um, and uh, I, I showed early stages of being a sort of technology junkie at the time, because I was really, really, apart from this sort of wonderful place, I was fascinated by um, sort of cultural stuff from the anthropology. But I also used to go to my dad's office and phone my grandfather <coughs> Um, so I was, I was pretty hooked on, on technology from a very young age. Um, this was me at university, it was not quite me at university, but I, uh, <laughs> I did the first year of a PhD in AI. And um, the reason I put this photo is because these were the machines that I used, which were silicon graphics in the computers. Way back in the day, were wonderful things. It used to make um, uh, lots of the early sort of animated uh, movies and things. Um, it was very hard to get lab time on them. And um, I used to try and, uh, so I'd be there later on doing my, doing my stuff. And my first exposure to AI, I did the first year of a PhD, um, and it was trying to make sense, um, big uh, corpus, uh, corpuses of language, and trying to match them up. So now I'm for, uh, this is the subject object and all that stuff, M massive um, bodies of language. And I thought, Jesus, there must be a better way to be reading through these and trying to match the tags and make it up. So, so we tried to compute the program and steadily succeeded, but it gave me an idea of the potential things. Um, uh, and my next thing was um, uh, programming uh, monsters in, in games, uh, trying to get monsters to um, run around in a realistic way. So that's quite a hard problem to solve. You can self driving cars is quite hard. It's, it's easier than self driving cars because maybe you die if you get it wrong. Uh, but also, people stop playing the game if the monsters. Um, so, um, so anyway, it was, uh, so uh, a, a four years of my life dedicated to, to trying to program really good monsters. Um, this wasn't one of them, but it's a nice feature. Um, and my third phase of my exposure to AI um, came when I received this email. Um, uh, for those at the back, it says, I want to know where you live. I've got a gun and I'm not afraid to use it. And at the time, I was I run, I was running in, um, a business which I brought over from the US. It was called RateMyTeachers.ie, which allowed you to go and rate your teachers. And I'm the son of a teacher, and my wife's an ex-teacher. Anyway, we had a big problem with a huge database of user-generated content, and people were abusing it. They were writing nasty things. There were lots of them writing nasty things. And one of them had written a beautiful thing about a, uh, a chap in Ireland. And he wrote to me and said, oh, I've got to go and I'm not thinking. And I was slightly worried at the time because I was sort of, you know, sort of nice and not meant to be nasty to anyone in the whole world. And so I thought, this is, this is a bad thing. And I don't want too much more of this in my life. And my wife's like, Jesus, what the fuck? And he's going, why would I do this? So anyway, I, I, I found a nerd. Um, so I'm not proper than I found a nerd. And the nerd um, from Oxford University, a um, great program which went through this huge backlog of user-generated content 
and sorted out the nonsense. So it wasn't just filtering for uh, you know, read file, uh, but also um, constructs which were likely to be um, dodgy. And it did that because we had lots of um, real users flagging up dodgy content, and it processed through the, back the backlog, and it learned as it went along and it actually got better. And it's still in use in lots of uh, user generated content spaces of great kind of compressors and, and others, others that. that um, so that, that was the first um, sort of intersection of that. So it's an interesting little product which is still in use and saved, didn't save my bacon, I wrote back to the guy and said, terribly sorry, well of course we're moving it. Uh, and he said, oh well that's decent use right back. I didn't really want to give you, I just... So, my life has been a... Um, an, I, uh, one of the things I thought about Richard's slides is the magnificent exposition of how to write slides and the on the back. So apologies, I'm more of an AI person than a graphics person. But um, this thing is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, just to let you know, the sort of peak of Mount Stupid is here. Confidence is going up here. So early on, we're very confident in what we can do, but, but actually we're completely incompetent. We know nothing. And then you've got down to the value of this there, the slope of arrival to expert. And I'm sure we've all been through this. Um, and I've been through it multiple times, so I think that I'm, uh, I, you know, I start to think I'm really good at something, and then I think, I mean, you know, the person who's sitting next to me is just way ahead of me. So, so it's an iterative process, isn't it? Um, uh, and I can't really claim to be an expert at anything very much other than buying coffee, but, um, but uh, that's, uh, that's a model, and we'll come back to it. I don't think we're going to have to try for it. Uh, really it's too small. But there's a 15 questions. And I'm going to give you a flavour of the first five of them. Are we going to, um, what I'd like you to do is think of, think of your score, one to five, okay? So I'll read them out and then quietly think of what your score is. And then we'll multiply it up. So you're going to, you're going to have to do some maths as well. You're going to have to multiply it by three. It's a complicated algorithm. So we're going to do all 15. Do you find yourself spending more time on your cell or smartphone than you realise? So, so if you do, you just, just sort of put a finger down. Or <laughs> but don't tell the person next door to you, right? So, do you find yourself mindlessly passing time on a regular basis by staring at your cell phone or smartphone? Do you seem to lose track of time when your cell phone or smartphone, when you're on your cell phone or smartphone? I'm going to just say smartphone. Um, do you find yourself spending more time texting, tweeting, or emailing as opposed to talking to people in person? I, I work in, a, in an office with eight or nine people, and quite often people will message each other instead of getting over and talking to them. Uh, has the amount of time you spent on your cell or smartphone been increasing? Do you spend more? Okay. So um, multiply it by um, three. Three. There's, there's going to be a dozen better algorithms or something, but anyway. Well, uh, uh, now, so how many how many people do we have at this end of things? So like the three end of things. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do the six end of things. That's not bad, not bad. So, so most of us are at the nine end of things or beyond, right? So uh, how many nines and beyonds? So everybody else. I'm I'm, I'm definitely not done. So that that is Consider seeing a psychologist, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist who <laughs> specialises in behavioural addiction. So um, there's a problem that we all have. Um, but we'll come on to it. 10% uh, of Americans, I, I was on Radio Oxford the other day, and, and talking about AI and this stuff. And this was the stat that we ended the show on because uh, nobody in the office could do it. 10% uh, of Americans have checked their phones during sex. Uh, 40% have done it more than 10 times in the last year, which is astonishing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm married with children, I don't, I don't think I've had 40 sex 40 times in the last year. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, 69% um, uh, of people have checked their phones on and check their phones on and do, uh, and 59% of you are on a regular basis. Any, any new phone users here? Yeah, I'm afraid of it. We're, we're at it. Um, so, so I can summarize, but this is um, BJ Fogg. I'm sure you're advertising people say all know BJ Fogg. Hands up, he doesn't know BJ Fogg. It's just human ear, basically. Yeah. Okay, so there's a little bit of homework. My only bit of homework to do is 
go and look at standard behavior, search that BJ Clock. Super guy. Very interesting. Um, this is coming back to how we make things, uh, as decomposing how we make things uh, addictive. Um, so there's a trigger, an internal or external trigger. So uh, I was exchanging LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is not trying to drive this sort of behavior. We go to a meetup like this, we exchange something or other. I, I, I go and I find Rachel on one thing and I'm like, yeah, I found her, yay, um, it's the right thing. Uh, and we exchange contacts. As a little reward, she writes back and says, lovely to see you, and I say, lovely to see you. And, um, and then we make an investment. I, I write something, I say, it was a fantastic talk um, that you gave at IDB, so I put some rich looks, wonderful. So anyway, and then I use LinkedIn. One of you guys probably don't use LinkedIn. But that's, I'm just giving you an example. It's not, not to say that that's exactly what we should do. Um, so I'll keep your word, I might go into the one. Is everyone going to be able to buy your one? I'm going to be able to buy your one. So this is a sort of central thesis. So we're going to have a tiny bit of history because I, it, this amazed me when I found it out. But um, by the end of the 1930s, <coughs> the open trade was already and was to remain the world's most valuable single commodity trade in the 19th century, which just blew my mind. It's like, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's just a huge number. So what used to happen was that um, we sold opium to the Chinese, uh, the Chinese um, sold us, um, uh, sold the Americans tea, and um, we sold, we bought cotton from the Americans. And there's a big uh, sort of cycle, of which Bristol, of course, had a part in that um, cycle. Um, uh, so yeah, so it starts off in India, opium, I don't know China, this is a, a jade curve, a hockey stick, which we marked as a so fond of. Uh, so in 1729, we didn't send, uh, send many chests to China. By um, 1832, 25,000 chests. And something like in coastal China, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the adult population were addicted to opium at that time. It's just an astonishing thing. The Chinese actually wrote to um, Queen Victoria and said, look, Please stop sending me this open um, But we ignore them. So, uh, Gladstone, I'm in dread of uh, the uh, judgment of God upon England for our national iniquity towards China. That would be in 1842. Um, Johnny Maston Company, biggest uh, importer or exporter of opium, like 14 years later. Uh, the use of opium is not a curse, but a comfort and a benefit to the hard working Chinese. This is what I wanted. Um, so anyway, we were, we, were, we were making good out of addiction, but even back then. There's some pictures, that's a New York opium bill. I'm sure it's a bit grainy, but everybody's absolutely whacked out of their mind. And we'll come back to it uh, in a bit. And now we're going to switch forward. And my hypothesis is, run with me on this one, is that the AI revolution is a bit like the sort of opium revolution. It's got elements of commonality to it. So uh, apologies if sometimes things jump around a bit. That's my skull. Um, so this is Andrew Ng. Does anybody know who Andrew Ng is? Yeah. So X stands just at X Coursera, X by the chief scientist. He's just set up deeplearning.ai and landing.ai. Um, this one is, um, you can learn deep learning stuff. It's quite good. Uh, landing.ai is, is uh, AI in the country. Uh, if anybody wants to buy the main name for .ai, I'm a, a reseller of them, and I've got 150 really good ones, so, yeah, just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> and then we're not supposed to play it, so I've got Anyway, so the Jardine and Mattersons of today, um, uh, there used to be Exxon Mobil, we were hooked on oil, uh, GE, Microsoft, City, Bank of Now, in 2017, we've just had, 2018, we've just had uh, Apple, first truly oil company, swiftly followed by Amazon. I mean, that's an insane valuation. I don't I mean, there, there are all these huge countries that um, the economics are good. Anyway. But these are the Jardine Mattersons. This is my thesis, the Jardine Mattersons of today. Jardine Mattersons, incidentally, is still a huge conglomerate like, of nature. Um, this is my shit drawing. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's not even my own idea. It's the, the innovation is, is, um, is Scott Galloway. Uh, I hope you all follow Scott Galloway, a wonderful guy. Um, but I won't teach you in a second. So, you know, Google's got the brain, God, in Scott Gallery, look, Facebook is the heart, Amazon is your gut, and um, feeding it, and, 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 and that sort of, and, and, and Apple is the little penis. <laughs> <laughs> or 
vagina if you're a female. It's good to be able to say that. So the top five, you know, you know all this stuff, so I'm going to go over it really quickly, but it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're addicted to the social stuff, right? Um, and, the, and the worrying thing, this is a worrying statistic for those involved in advertising, I know this course says that there's a high ground which is, which is there, which I think we can all aspire to get to, and I will come back into that one, but uh, Facebook and Google's a huge sort of domination, and the same platform economics are going on in China, but there's a little diversion to China for a few minutes in a second. Um, Coming on to things like accuracy of this technology that's changing all our lives and we're becoming addicted to. So Google is, become, is just that cross the threshold of human recognition. Obviously there's an average there, some of the people are going to be at those. Um, uh, Alexa, I don't know why I threw this slide in, but anyway, basically <coughs> Echo, Echo is an interesting thing because you can you know, tell it to buy stuff. Uh, and obviously people with Echoes spend more hours with, but also from a brand perspective, it's, it's, it presents a huge different set of challenges, as you can imagine. So, like Scott Galloway's example of these Alexa buy batteries, and, and, and Alexa says, Do you want to buy Amazon Basics? That's all I have, kind of thing. So, uh, so if you're Duracell, how do you get onto Alexa? Um, yeah. a, the, the people, the people who spend more hours and buy more echoes than really, isn't it? It's not the other way around. Yeah, 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 there's that too. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah. Good old What's your name? Lorenzo. Lorenzo, well done, Lorenzo. I, I like the t-shirt, by the way. Lorenzo's got a SpaceX t-shirt on and a worldwide one of the content. So, uh, thanks. Good. Talk to Lorenzo afterwards. He probably knows a lot more than that. Sure. Um, this is Babylon.ai. I was chatting with the other day. Um, does anybody hear the Babylon service? Have you signed up for the GP stuff? Anyway, uh, just earlier this year, it, it, um, it, it took the GP test, uh, a segment of it, um, and it was better at diagnosing than a human, um, which reminded me of something when I was doing my AI stuff, of, of, there was a program called MySim, which was better at diagnosing uh, the human back in sort of like 1960 for what kind of bacteria it is, but we were still worried. And I think there's definitely a role for the creatives and the communicators amongst us to persuade people that, hey, maybe this is AI stuff isn't quite so scary, or we might not completely understand it, but if you're walking to your GP and they've got, to Phil's point, if they've, they've got, behind them they've got the AI and they can use that to, uh, to help guide their diagnosis, maybe you'll get a better outcome. And if, if you, you know, well, that's, you know, in terms of deaths per, per population, that might be significant, right? You, you might be the person who's um, misdiagnosed or not misdiagnosed because um, your GP could be monitoring um, these bit of machine learning. And, and maybe it's a communication professional who let me down if we don't help um, bring that back. Um, this is my favourite movie ever, Airplane. Where, but is there anyone on board who knows how to fly a plane? So one of the startups I'm involved with is, is, a, is using AI in the aviation context, which sounds like a good idea, apart from the same dynamics um, uh, happen. So pilots typically routinely overload the amount of fuel they take on, they worry about getting home to white computers, but there's a huge economic costs and carbon costs and all the rest of that stuff, but you have to persuade people that using AI is a good idea. Um, so that's the challenge I think we have collectively is to how, when somebody does come up with a good idea, a good algorithm, how can we get people to use it? Um, you all know uh, the levels of AI automation, but um, uh, cars getting much, much more safe. There's uh, five got AI whistles, then we do work with those guys. Affleck really look, look them up. Um, they're doing um, really good stuff on self driving cars. So, back to the point you know, the machines are getting much more safer. So, this is a bit, a bit cheaty, this graph, but, but effectively, 130, 140 million miles of uh, tons of autopilot um, and, and only one death, which in the scheme of things is just, it's just amazing. But we're all, we're all still a little bit worried when we see a car driving up with no driver. As I was saying to Richard earlier, I mean, you know, maybe that's some things, but uh, from a creative, from an advertising, from a marketing perspective, how do we persuade people that it's actually going to be okay? It's a good thing. A brief detour and into China and then back to China. So, so there's an irony about the Opium Wars, which we basically fucked up China big time. I recommend reading that, some, some learned books, um, for, for, for a 
good number of years because we sort of drugged them and bombed them back into uh, a, a more primitive state. Um, AlphaGo, we know that uh, Google wrote the thing that, that, that beat their, their Go guide, but he was the he was their, their sort of national hero. So it's a bit like, um, you know, um, I was thinking of Gary Lindsay, but David Beckham or one of the, one of the more new football okay. guys. Harry Kane, I think you, I'm not a huge fan of that, sorry. Uh, but yes, thank you, Rich. Harry Kane being beaten by a uh, robot that ran around it. This, this is the narrow domain. But anyway, you notice that's China, but it's just insane because China's gone from a tiny, tiny fraction of e commerce sales globally in 2005 to 42% of it now. And I, I recommend this, uh, there's a TED talk about the, how e commerce is changing in China. Either go to China or um, or just watch them in TED Talks. Just just amazing what's going on. Yeah. Anyway, they're spending a lot of time on their mobiles, as we are, but in China it's even more. Um, so we're coming back to the downsides. So we're going back to the downsides. So we had the picture of the opium dead users, and here's that modern day equivalent of the uh, opium dead. Um, so it's serious stuff, isn't it? We we got. AI, could AI be, so you know, AI's got the potential to do wonderful things, but if it, all it's doing is sucking us deeper into our devices and um, making us fundamentally unhappier, uh, then maybe we need to think about it. So this was a huge survey, so sort of like um, half a million uh, US uh, citizens, uh, they surveyed them, and um, suicide rate rose by 65% in the five years um, uh, for 2015, 2015. 2010 to 2015, the uh, number of girls with severe depression rose by 58%. Um, suicide rose by 65 I have three daughters. One of them is de definitively addicted to uh, information technology, Snapchat and everything else. Um, so the only correlation that they consistently found, and sorry about that, I'll read the numbers out for those of So 48% of those who spent five or more hours a day on their phones had thought about suicide or made plans for it, versus 28% of those who um, so that's a, a huge difference, and the only significant variable wasn't income or uh, homework pressure, or any of these other things, it was the amount of time that they spent on their devices. So it's, a, it's genuinely troubling, I know it's a sort of only a small micro of things, but I do think, for Richard's point, if we want to do good, um, and, and I'm, if you want to do good with their time on this earth, <laughs> yeah, so if we want to do good, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Max is the only one. You're a good man. Yeah, yeah. You get, you're like you're like green man. You'll turn out to be nice in the end. I know. Um, so anyway, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the, my my point is, I think I think the thing is, is that uh, what I found is working with lots of clever people is that it's it's really it's potentially impossible. I will ever be uh, you know a proper machine learning expert. I think it's impossible. Um, but it, I, I'm shuffling along this continuum, and I know sometimes fall back to me, and I think we all have to try, right? Because if we stop trying, then, then that's, that's the sort of middle bit. Um, so I encourage you, uh, as Phil was saying, to, you know, uh, make some experiments. I can't remember your phrase, but, you know, use, use um, come on to things like this, um, come back to things like this, um, and really just take the time to um, find out more about it, talk to nerds, they're not bad people. Um, go to the university or to, I don't know what HP research lab is nowadays, but whatever it is, but I'm sure there's some clever people out there who know stuff that have applied for AI, have chat with them, there are other people who do AI stuff in Bristol. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it can't be used for a demon as well as even that. Just use these superpowers that you could be getting for good, um, apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. <laughs>